art. William Blake said, The imagination is not a state, it is the human existence itself. Art. What is art? For some, it is easier to approach this question by considering the age-old saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Do we not project the attributes of beauty onto what we consider to be art? Beauty being defined as something that provides a perceptual experience of pleasure, meaning, or satisfaction. Up until the early 20th century, it was normal to assume that all art aims at beauty. However, this view soon gave way to the anxiety of the sublime that was to birth postmodern thought. Alfred Orange said, Art is a power tool that style must render more seductive. How best to define art remains a subject of much contention. Theodore Adorno claimed that it is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident. Perhaps the definition offered by Leo Tolstoy gives us something to go upon. Tolstoy defined art as a human activity that one may consciously hand on to others the feelings that one has lived through. Could the value of art then said to be one of empathy? Clearly, whatever art may be goes far beyond its mere appearances. Frederick Nietzsche said that art is the proper task of life. It is only from the 18th century that there has been a distinction between fine arts and useful arts. Consequently, arts are seen as less than important within education and society at large. Yet as Ken Wilber recapitulates, art is the great bridge between science and morals, and is not the world's salvation in the hands of artists. John Dewey pointed out that the unity of aesthetics and ethics is in fact reflected in our understanding of what constitutes attractive and morally acceptable behaviour. Eli Siegel beautifully put that the world, art and self explain each other, that each is the aesthetic oneness of opposites, that all beauty is making one of opposites, and making one of opposites is what we are going after in ourselves. Furthermore, he stated that the ultimate purpose of every human being is to like oneself, and at the same time like the reality that exists along with oneself. A fundamental principle of his philosophy was that every person is in a fight between contempt for the world and respect for it. Similar in some sense to Sigmund Freud's Eros and Thanatos instinctual drives, or Nietzsche's Apollonian and Dionysian dialogue. Plato said, the beautiful is the splendour of the true. Art transcends our explanations and analysis. Our appreciation of art becomes more of a sentience, more of a feeling than an appraisal. Undeniably, art, like language, has a magical and mystical quality to it. Everything from crude cave paintings in Namibia to the sacred geometry within Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Such works of art are cultural artifacts, a window into the world of the artist that created them. Art emerged as a result of the brain's ability to imagine things internally and represent them externally, to turn a subject into an object. Cultures are defined by their images. Their very survival depends on sustaining a common and cohesive semiotic space so that individuals within a culture can coexist and comprehend their socially constructed reality. At the root of any culture is cult. All cultures contain within them cults. All religions start as cults. The symbols of cults are absorbed into the cultural amalgamation that supersedes them. As such, the history of culture is really the story of the evolution of the psyche. Carl Jung said, the human psyche is the womb of all the arts. T.S. Eliot remarked, great art communicates before it is understood. It is from our imagination that new realities arise. Even within the realm of science, something must first be imagined in the mind before it can take shape in the physical world. There is nothing metaphysical about the fact that thoughts precede things. Art as such is a metalinguistic tool. Artistic concepts can be realized without necessarily having the words to describe them. John Russell wrote that there is in art a clairvoyance for which we have not yet found a name, and still less an explanation. Meanwhile, Schlein provides a captivating account of how artists foresaw every major advance in modern physics using image and metaphor prior to their expression in numbers and equations. Cubism, for example, showed that a painting can have multiple points of view, and that each one is just as good as any other. Schlein compared this style of art with Albert Einstein's later theory of relativity. However, in some sense, Nietzsche's perspectivism can be seen as a precursor for both. Another example is illusionist art, whereby two distinct images are embedded within the same canvas but the observer can only see one at a time. For example, the Rubin vase or Rubin face, which can be seen as either a vase or a face, but not both at the same time. Perceiving the foreground of one image negates the perception of the other. Schlein believed this style of art was depicting Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, 
whereby knowledge of either the momentum or position of an electron negates high precision knowledge of the other variable. Schlein suggested that the increasing abstraction and minimalization in art reflects the impenetrability and subjectivity of quantum physics. As others have also reasoned, it is not physics which is at the cutting edge of perception, but art. As Rapound said, the artist is the antenna of the race. The ability for art to precede words provides it with a transcendental quality. Gurdjieff believed that only some forms of art possess this quality, a form he called objective art, art that has a living presence, a genuine or inspiring power, for example the Great Pyramid, art that acts as a receptacle and repository of transcendence that may reciprocally transmit a similar transformation to others. It would seem, therefore, from one perspective, that, that art is useless unless it serves some function which ties it back to direct experience. As some neo-shamans have expressed, artists are the closest thing to a shaman we will find within our culture. The act of magic is itself described as an art or a craft. All of the arts and sciences owe their origin to the animistic craft of shamanism. It is through the art that one is able to transmute the will of the muse into the world. Terence McKenna said, Art's task is to save the soul of mankind, and that anything less is dithering while Rome burns. If the artist cannot find the way, then the way cannot be found. The intuitive quality of art serves to enliven the mythos. As Campbell reiterates, the artist is the one who communicates myths for today. Whenever we are told a story, we do not see words flashing in our heads, but rather elicit a cascade of images and feelings. Stories are visually apprehended. Art, therefore, is a way of telling a story. However, art tells us more than just the story of individuals, it tells us about our own cultural narrative, the story of the self. McLuhan suggested that art always functions as a counter-environment designed to make visible what is usually invisible about society. Likewise, Jung suggested that the artist's role is to help us all see the messages that emanate from the collective unconsciousness. Jung furthermore proposed that art can be used as a form of psychotherapy in which the patient is able to release emotional distress by creating art. Art therefore can be seen as a shamanic tool. As Paul Levy writes, Creatively expressing what is moving us is the very act which liberates us from the compulsion to having to unconsciously recreate these energies self-destructively in a way that continually re-traumatizes both ourselves and the world around us. He continues, the psyche is both the subject and object of art, it is literally building a bridge so as to telepathically communicate with itself. However, the artist is not just transmuting their own inner demons onto a canvas, but they are also internalizing a personal reflection of the same demons that are being played out collectively on the world stage. Henry David Thoreau said, the world is but a canvas to our imagination. Art also plays a key role within political movements, everything from propaganda to anti-art. Anarchism has had a long association with the arts, especially in music and literature. Many anarchists are particularly inspired by surrealist and avant-garde art, which laid the foundations of postmodern art. The art movements of the early 20th century emphasized the liberation of the imagination and subjectivity from the constraints of social order. For example, the Dadists of the 1920s believed excessive rational thought and capitalist values had brought conflict of the war upon the people. Their protest was reflected in anti-art movements which rejected all prior definitions of art in an effort to subvert the existing social order. Punk rock is another obvious example that has taken much inspiration from the potent imagery and symbolism associated with anarchism and situationist rhetoric. Many modern-day anarchists were introduced to the ideas of anarchism initially through the anti-authoritarian sentiment which many punk songs express. Ellen Key remarked, The more horrifying this world becomes, the more art becomes abstract. Whereas Terence McKenna said, Abstract art is a kind of eschatological malaise. All notion of any forward motion towards a transcendental ideal have been put aside for the exploration of an idiosyncratic vision. Most people would agree that a degradation of art and music is occurring. What most people may not realize is that such a cultural degradation threatens the very survival of a civilization. When aesthetic values are perverted and corrupted, then so too are the relationships between people within society. As Oscar Wilde says, life imitates art far more than art imitates life. The decay of art is really a reflection of our own moral decay, depersonalization and psychic disconnectedness. We have become passive consumers of entertainment rather than the producers of art. How are we to decide what is aesthetically wholesome? David Bohm reminds us that the word health 
in English is based on the Anglo-Saxon word hail, meaning whole. That is, to be healthy is to be whole. Likewise, the English word holy is based on the same etymological root as whole. This all indicates that wholeness or integrity is absolutely necessary to make life worth living. This is of course by no means a new philosophy, but rather a remembering of much older wisdom. Terence McKenna believed that we need to move from an economic axiom of time is money to time is art. In a cooperative economy, instead of working for money, money can become a side effect of doing good work, i.e. work that is aesthetically wholesome. No longer being a slave to the money, work becomes a source of beauty, service, fun or self-expression. The worker, in other words, becomes an artist. Daniel Pinchbeck epitomizes McKenna's sentiments in his visionary essay entitled Business Shamanism, in which he says, As the history of the last century reveals what art is, the vital essence of modern culture constantly changes. In traditional civilizations, art was inseparable from a way of life and of being, from expressions of the sacred. It is only modern culture that made art into a separate domain, that secularized it, and created an abstruse critical vocabulary around it in order to turn works of art into fetishized commodities. We are reaching the end of this paradigm, returning to a time when art will be reintegrated into society, not as a window dressing, but as an expressive essence, as Jose Algalas put it. The construct that time is money is a misconception, an error of the industrial age. Modern humans became fixated on a collective hallucination of linear time, ignoring the fractal spirals of the surrounding universe. In the next phase of our evolutionary unfolding, we will discover that time is not money, time is art. Out of freedom, we have the opportunity to reinvent planetary civilization so that it meshes with human potential and matches the ecstatic flights of the human imagination, co-creating society as a fantastic collective art form. Can you ask a baby not to cry? Can you ask a bird not to fly? Can you ask a flower not to bloom? Life without art is death after doom. Life without movement, still and content. Worthless, meaningless time is spent. Idle, just slumber, just plain and bland. No strokes, no pens, or pencil in hand. No music, no prose, no blisters on toes. No broken-hearted dancers, no shows. Only true artists understand and know how life would be so grey and dark. A life without love is life without art. Rehearsals and go-sees and cattle calls. No models, no musicians at all. No MP3s or morphs, nor any HTML. No lyrics lost, no CDs to sell. No beats, no bangs, no blues, no rock. No jazz, no reggaeton, no not. Museum walls crying for frames, artifacts, unknown fossil names. Marcus, paint, oil and lead, art cannot live if it is dead. Art is a baby waiting to be, nurtured and loved, eternally free. Art is a rose in full bloom, life without art is death after doom.